So in this talk, um, Emilia and I will present one part of our ongoing collaborative research on children's comprehension of audiovisual narrative. The reason why we are doing this is based on the observation that many parents would have had when their kids started watching children's films. Some of the film editing features used in those films are actually quite complex in terms of space and time structures in a story. We often wonder whether filmmakers' choices really help children to understand the contents and even to interpret the social and moral themes, which are the main targets of all these Disney films, for example. So today we will focus on the issue of time in children's film and present a coding scheme for analyzing and investigating children's narrative comprehension. So our talk is gonna be three parts. Emilia will first present a motivation and previous in empirical work on time in children's visual narratives. We will then present our coding scheme and empirical test we did with young children to examine whether our coding scheme is empirically uh, supported or not. Emilia. Okay, so the research that we are presenting today is motivated by research showing previously that children's understanding of time is an important aspect of their cognitive development, and it is essential for their ability to learn in a range of different areas. And so understanding then how multimodal design guides children's comprehension of temporal relations in narratives can help us develop principles for designing more effective educational media, particularly because narratives have got a very high status as a vehicle for learning, especially a vehicle for learning about temporal relationships. Okay, so in this presentation, the question that we will address is how does the co-patterning or the combination of semantic features of time in narrative impact children's understanding of events in audiovisual narratives? Previous studies of time in narrative have looked at both time in a range of different texts. So you'd be familiar with Jeanette's work in narrative uh, discourse, but also there have been studies of time in multimodal discourse. And the studies that are particularly relevant to us are those that have looked at children's comprehension of time in a range of different narratives, picture books, pictorial narratives, and also moving images. What is interesting about these studies is that they have looked at challenging features of time or challenging temporal relationships, but they have tended to look at these relationships in isolation from each other. So for example, Hoodless has considered anachronies such as flashback and flash forward in picture books and children's understanding of those. Solek has considered a children's understanding of chronology and time scales in pictorial narratives. And there is some research on moving images and a lot of attention has been paid to pacing with McCollum and Bryan, for example, showing that pacing in commercial children's TV shows is much faster than in educational shows. And a study later on by Lilliet et al. showing that fast pacing when combined with fantastical events in narratives in audiovisual narratives depletes four to six year olds children's executive function and a much more recent study showing in fact revisiting some of these uh, videos in Lilia that are showing that in fact some of those uh, films that were shown to deplete executive function they did have higher flicker rate edge density and situational changes but actually longer duration shots. So that really shows us the importance of looking beyond a single feature. And this is what we've done in a study that we recently published, where we presented a framework that seeks to combine all of these different temporal features so that we can examine how they co-pattern or how they are combined in uh, audiovisual narratives. So, um... We are going to present our coding scheme and see how we can apply this to analyze and investigate in children's understanding and comprehension of the time. So as you can see here, we actually um, combine the features based on the previous empirical work that um, Emilia just summarizes. And um, we also um, hypothesize that within these features, there could be um, some particular features in our framework that are more challenging for children to understand the other features. For example, in the first um, system time point, we hypothesize that in exact time points will be more demanding for children to understand than exact time point in terms of um, event layers. Multiple, multiple layers will be more demanding uh, for children to understand than uh, single layers. So in this coding scheme here, we uh, color code 
the features, as you can see here, the features we mark in red are generally more demanding for children than uh, these features marked in yellow, uh, blue. So all this we will exemplify the later in detail using our example clips. Um, so I will start with the first uh, system, event time. The first system event time can be divided uh, into two subsystems, uh, time points and uh, event layers. So I will exemplify our entire coding scheme by using this um, film clips from the BBC TV show, Teacup Travels. So this BBC TV show is the, um, um, particularly introducing life in ancient times for children. So it introduced um, ancient times around the world and the story of each episode is narrated by a woman called Aunt Lizzie. And each episode is about how a child character encounters people in ancient times and how they interact with these people and how um, this child learn from them. In this particular episode, we see a boy called Elliot in interacting with a seamstress in ancient Britain, and Iliad is trying to help her to get her symbol. Find a thimble the right size in the village. I had mine specially made because my fingers are really small. Where do you live? Miles away, on the other side of the mountains. It's really hard to get to. It was still afternoon, and already it had got so complicated. Excuse me, stop. Elliot had persuaded the Queen that he was a friend. He had helped Agnes by trying to get the Queen to stand still. He'd learned that stitching leather was a lot harder than it looked. It's really hard. And he'd thought getting a new thimble would be a doddle. He couldn't leave Agnes without a thimble, could he? Okay, so in these short clips, we have six shots. And as you can see uh, from what I underlined here, um, five shots, um, starting from shot, set, uh, shot two to shot six, they are all narrated by the off-screen narrator, Aunt Lizzie. So um, this is substantially um, uh, narrating the flashback of the boy, Elliot, and um, it, um, it's specifically narrating what's going on, what he is thinking, and when this flashback happens. So uh, we start with the first system event time and see how we can code the features of event time in this clip. So here we can see the structure of the six shot. Um, we start with uh, event layer. It starts with a single layer and the first shot is just ancient Britain, the event portrayed um, in ancient Britain. In the second shot, we have two layers because Aunt Lizzie started to narrate from the present time. And then after Iliad's Flashback starts, we have three layers. We have ancient Britain and then uh, on Lizzie's uh, present time narration, and then another layer that is uh, at Elias flashback. And then after the flashback finishes, we um, come back to uh, two layers. So there is um, a variation of um, event layers across this six shot. And then we have a time point. Uh, although we have the jump between flashback and um, the uh, ancient Britain, but we have on Lizzie's off-screen narration verbally specify the time points very clearly. So we know that this um, flashback actually happens in the same afternoon because Aunt Lizzie says so. And we have also seen these um, uh, events also in a previous clip. And then the second uh, um, system is sequencing. So um, we can use the same example to see the coding of sequencing. It can be um, chron chron uh, chronological or achronological. We can see from this clip, it starts with a chronological sequencing, a continuous shot. And then we have an achronological jump into the flashback. Within the flashback, we have a, a chronological sequencing again, but um, Aunt uh, Lizzie narrated three separate events elliptically. So these are not continuous, but ellip elliptical events. And then we have a chronological jump back to the Iliad's um, thinking position again. And um, in terms of pacing, one can measure pacing in terms of shot length or number of changes of events. So the shot length we calculated, uh, it's around 2.8 seconds, which is counted as rather uh, fast pacing compared to other films in empirical studies. 
And now we have here uh, six shots. There are two changes of events. So change between the dialogue of Agnes um, and Boy and then Iliad's flashback. So there are two changes of events here. So um, we have the third um, coding that is a frequency. It's about whether an event is unique, like how it starts. This is an event that audience hasn't seen before, so it's a unique event. But the flashback is a repetitive event. We have seen these three separate events before. Uh, the audience has seen this. This is just repeating exactly the same visuals um, in the flashback. And then we also have an iterative um, event. Mean, that means these type of um, uh, events, like Elias stand there and, and thinking. It's the same types of events that we have seen in shot two. So um, that um, the audience is actually familiar with these events. It's not any more unique to the audience. So if we map out all the coding, uh, all the coding from our uh, framework, we can see all the features map out like this. And as I mentioned earlier, we can then see how um, some more demanding features are used and some less demanding, so straightforward features are used. And here you can see that um, quite complex temporal features, for example, a chronological jump into flashbacks, and then three layers of events are actually complemented by clear temporal cues like exact time points and repetitive visuals. So um, our hypothesis is that in this clip, based on our coding, we um, hypothesis that the children should have no uh, problem comprehend the meaning of the narrative. However, um, this is not always the case. So what we want to do is to see whether we could empirically compare um, different films uh, with the com um, temporal complexities, whether we can uncover these different complexities using our coding scheme. So we start uh, with, so we compare the two Disney uh, clips. One is Ratatouille and one is Tangled. And we use very similar construction of flashbacks and uh, coded based on our framework. So this is the first example. So this is the coding based on our scheme. And we can see that um, they, uh, it starts with a rather straightforward feature like chronological continuous sequencing with a single layer. But then there is a flashback of them uh, into the man's childhood where he saw his mom uh, cooking the same dish. So we have a chronological jump into an exact time point of childhood and then uh, event layer become two layers. Nevertheless, we have some more straightforward cues like chronological uh, continuous um, uh, uh, sequencing and iterative patterns showing the very same um, types of event like flashback into the, um, the main character's eyes. And then there is the zooming out uh, from the character's eyes showing that actually we are coming back to the present time, a leaving flashback. So we have the exact time points too. So um, we, uh, our hypothesis is that complex temporal features like flashback, a chronological jump are complemented by clear temporal cues. But in this example,
So we use exactly the same me uh, methods, our coding scheme to code the temporal features of this clip. So we can see that in the beginning, we have some continuous straightforward cues like continuous um, point of view shots, single layer, and it repeats a few times showing how this um, Rapunzel Solomon character look at the sun back and forth. Um, and then we have a chronological jump into her flashback as a baby seeing the, uh, her parents from the cradle. But there isn't a um, clear time point cue to where, um, when exactly that is. And before it, uh, the, the audience grasp what's going on, they are more um, demanding features like a chronological jumps into certain family pictures and then into um, Rapunzel's in the dark, realizing she is a princess. And um, the event times, like time point is also in exact. So the analysis of our coding, uh, based on our coding scheme shows that complex temporal features in the middle here, the flashback are followed by more demanding temporal cues. So there is no um, complementation between uh, demanding and straightforward cues. So our hypothesis is that um, based on the coding like this, this must be very challenging and difficult for children to understand or, um, the, the temporal structure of this uh, narrative. Amelia. So to examine this hypothesis, we designed a small exploratory study. So the first um, hypothesis we um, formulated was the children can comprehend the flashback in Ratatouille easily and would find the one entangled more challenging to comprehend. And a related hypothesis was that children who have watched the films previously, who are familiar with them, would comprehend these flashback scenes more easily. So what did we do then? We used convenience sample sampling to recruit 28 children as participants. We focused on children aged seven to 10 years of age, because from previous empirical research, we know that from about six to seven years of age, children begin to develop a basic understanding of anachronies in narratives. And from about 11 to 12, they display more adult-like comprehension and familiarity with cinematographic conventions. So between seven to 10, children's comprehension of time is much more likely to rely on their understanding uh, of discourse semantic narrative devices. The children were from Germany, Taiwan, and Australia, and some had seen Ratatouille and or Tangled, and some hadn't. So the procedure was as follows. So each child watched each of the clips, and after watching each clip, we asked them two questions. So what happened in the clip you just watched? Have you seen this movie before? So each child's answers were transcribed verbatim and then coded as either comprehending or not comprehending. With comprehending, what we were looking for is the child would perhaps in some cases mention the term flashback, but in other cases, they would say something that shows that they understood that this was showing someone, a character, remembering the past. So words like remembering would show that it the child comprehended. So children would then categorize those into whether or not they had watched the film. So an example of a child not comprehending um, the flashback in Tangled is Anna, nine years old, who had actually watched Tangled before. So she said Rapunzel was having a dream about the glowing light thing. She found a crown and she put it on and she woke up and it was just a dream. An example of a child comprehending the flashback was uh, Carlos, nine years old, also familiar with Tangled, who said that uh, she looked at the flag, she looked around the castle, and she saw the same symbol all over it. And then she remembers when she was a baby, she had the same symbol on her. And um, then she remembers about the crown. And then she actually also realizes that this was the, that she was the king's and uh, queen's daughter. So uh, what did our results show? We also had, before that, we also had a, an intercoder reliability test using Crippendorf's Alpha to check and we had a really um, a sufficiently high intercoder agreement of uh, 0.761 between three coders. So in terms of the first hypothesis, our results showed that indeed, um, you know, there was a significant association between uh, Ratatouille and Tangled and the comprehended, non-comprehended. So of the 28 children, 27 comprehended the flashback in Ratatouille. 
and only 14 comprehended the flashback in Tangled. And then looking at our next difference, whether they had watched the film or not, we saw that in fact, it didn't actually um, seem to be significant whether or not children had watched the film before. Because we see here that we have from those who watched Ratatouille, from, uh, you know, from the 15 who had watched for, uh, Ratatouille before, 14 comprehended the flashback and only one didn't. But from Tangled, from the 16 who had watched Tangled before, seven only comprehended and nine did not comprehend. What overall? Our empirical results supported um, our framework and that it can indeed be used to look at the co-patterning and temporal features in audiovisual narratives for children and then uh, examine how it impacts on children's comprehension of the narrative. So uh, we have then, as a major contribution, we feel that we've offered a framework for analyzing and a method for representing semantic features of time and how they interact in audiovisual narratives for children. And of course, this work can be expanded in many different ways. So we could explore and map out exactly how different semiotic resources are used to realize each feature across different modes and media. We can use the framework to inform guidelines for the design, selection, and use of audiovisual narratives in educational contexts, and also to adapt and apply the framework to analyze narratives across different media and also genres perhaps other than narratives that um, rely on temporal features. And then further studies can be developed, further empirical studies can be developed to test children's comprehension of time in audiovisual narratives that involve more children, of course, but also then could look at children of different age groups and examine cultural variation in the understanding of time in narrative and look at the impact on familiarity with film conventions and exposure to different media as well. Thank you for your attention.